I want to talk to you today on this topic. Scars. Anybody got any scars? I think just about everybody has some kind of scars. <laughs> uh, I've got an older brother. He's 11 years older than I am. <clears throat> uh, and he used to tell me there's a little scar right here on my finger. And he used to tell me that they left me in the incubator too long. I never was able to verify that. <laughs> <laughs> but as I got older, it just seemed to not make as much sense to me as it did when I was five, six, seven years old. <clears throat> uh, I, I understood after a while that if you had a scar there, chances are you're going to be burnt all over. So it must not have been the incubator that gave me that scar. I got a scar right here on this finger. I know where I got that one. <clears throat> we went to the mountains. My brother, I don't know if it was guilt or what, but he took me with him. And uh, we were camping out in the mountains up in uh, the Smoky Mountains. And Mother had, I don't know if she told him or if she told me, I don't remember. But either way, I wasn't supposed to buy anything dangerous while I was up there. So the first thing I bought was a knife. <laughs> I must have been, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. So I bought a knife, and when I got it back to the campsite... I found me a stick of wood and started whittling all the wrong way. <clears throat> and I got, I don't know if I got too excited. I don't know if I was doing such a good job and so impressed with myself that I wasn't paying attention. <clears throat> but I sliced down into that finger and it started bleeding. I thought I was going to die. <clears throat> uh <laughs> And my brother saw it, and he wrapped it up in something. And uh, mother found out about it after we got home. Mother found out that I had bought a knife. And I didn't see that knife again until I'd been married for 15 years. She confiscated it <laughs> to keep me from getting any more scars. <clears throat> uh, I was running through the house, something else mom told me not to do. Over to cousin's house, I was running through the house in my... <clears throat> My cousin was a uh, very skilled carpenter. He was just, he was a pro. And he built a, uh, a desk, and the top of the desk was a door, and he covered it in formica, and the, sh the edges of that formica desk were very sharp. Of course, I was just a kid. I don't remember, maybe four, five, six years old, about that tall. And I ran too close to that desk, and it caught me on my face right here. <coughs> made a big gash in my face. Mother took me to the doctor. They laid me down on that table, and, and pediatri pediatricians should not have bass voices. Pediatricians' voices ought to be high and lilting. You know, like, how are you today? But Dr. Chastain, anybody else go to Dr. Chastain? Oh, Lord. You remember that voice? It just resonated throughout those Hey, how are you today? And it just, oh, my God. And for a kid to hear that, especially one with his face gashed open, and they laid me down on that table, took this black cloth with a hole in it, laid it over my face, and then they approached me with a needle. It was about that long. <laughs> At that age, that's the way it looked. <laughs> They jugged that thing down in my face and started squirting stuff into my face. And then after a while, they got one of those little crooked needles, you know, that they used to sew things up with. <clears throat> started sewing on my face. And I think I screamed from the time I got there until the time I left. And I've got a scar. <laughs> you probably can't even see it now. <clears throat> got a scar from that encounter with the corner of that desk. Scars are uh, <clears throat> the visible evidence, though, that uh, you've had an injury. They're the visible signs of once painful encounters with suffering and hurt. 
But the scars that tell the most painful stories, <clears throat> those that are carried in the human mind, traumas that scar the emotions, the conscience, the soul. And those are the scars I want to talk to you about here for a little while today. Uh, <clears throat> Peter. If you remember Peter, say amen. He was the Pentecost preacher, the apostle that denied the Lord. He preached the Pentecost message that heralded the birth of the New Testament church, and he invited all to come and repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and filled with the Holy Ghost, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, say amen. But Peter's story could have ended much differently. Only a few weeks before the day of Pentecost, when he preached his world-changing message, Peter told everyone with an earshot that he didn't even know who Jesus was. Now, Jesus had told him to be careful. He said, now, Peter... Satan hath desired to have you, to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. He warned him, be careful, keep both eyes open, be aware. Satan's going to try to trip you up. <clears throat> he even told him how it would happen. He said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Luke chapter 22, verse 33. Peter didn't believe it. He didn't believe a lot of stuff. <clears throat> Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Lord, I'm not going to deny you. He was always doing stuff like that. Just, You know how sometimes folks, their mouth is in motion before their brain is in gear? You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes they just say stuff. And they say, oh, I need to, whoa, let me change. Well, it's too late. You can't undo what you did. You can't put words back in the bottle. Verse 33, and he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not grow this day before thou hast thrice, thrice, thrice you're going to deny that you know me. Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, and this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. With all that prayer by the Savior himself, Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. And with all that forewarning that he is going to fail, Peter's passionate nature got the best of him, and he failed anyway. He was tempestuous, hot-headed, emotional, short-tempered, volatile. But as soon as the rooster crowed, he was stricken with guilt and sought a place of repentance. He couldn't put his words back. You can't undo what you say. Once it's out there, it's out there. He couldn't undo the damage that had been done. He now had to live with his mistake. Think about it. He had to live with it. He had no options. <clears throat> I'm living with this scar, this scar, and this scar. Reminders of mistakes that I made. The scars are there. Thankfully, over time, they seem to fade. They're not quite as conspicuous, but the scars are still there. He couldn't put his words back in the bottle. He couldn't undo the damage that had been done. He wasn't going to have to live with his mistake now. But Jesus is forgiving. After the resurrection, Jesus asked first to see the repentant Peter. The Lord's most critical hour, Peter had denied him. He could have called it quits, slipped out of town just as the sun was rising that next morning. But the denying apostle wouldn't allow his past to dictate his future. Think about what I'm telling you this morning. On the day of Pentecost, he would rise above his failure. He would rise above the shame. He would rise above his denial and introduce the world to the salvation message of the cross. He was the denying Peter of the past but he would become the Pentecost preacher of the future because he refused to let his past dictate his future. 
But that still didn't eliminate the scar. That still didn't keep the devil from, from reminding him, Peter, do you remember what you did? And every time he stood up to preach, no doubt the spirits of the past came to haunt him. You don't deserve to be preaching this message. Nobody's really listening to you because they know what you did last week. Scars. <clears throat> Scattered throughout the scripture there are scarred men and women. <clears throat> Rahab was a harlot in Jericho that might have become just another victim of Israel's conquest and God's judgment. Instead, she put her past behind her and started life all over when she hung that scarlet thread out her window. Remember what the spies told her? You hang that scarlet thread out your window so that when we march around these walls and God gives us this city, your life will be spared. The wonderful thing is <clears throat> she eventually became one of the relatives of King David. That never would have happened had she not been willing to live with the scars. Zacchaeus, remember the little short tax collector? He could have lived out his days in the greed and arrogance of his tax collector's office, but he chose to rise above his past by climbing a sycamore tree and allowing Jesus to give his life new direction. And David, probably the ultimate example of Old Testament scars, would have been much less humiliating for David if he had just been content to live with the adultery and murder and conceal in robes of privilege all of the things that he had done, but he chose to repent, give the scars time to heal, and then compose psalms of contrition, encouragement, and praise and become a man after God's own heart. Then there was the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul was zealous in defending the law of the Old Testament. He had learned at the feet of Gamaliel, the premier teacher in Jerusalem at that time of the Mosaic Law. He didn't see that Jesus came to fulfill the law by becoming the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Paul <coughs> decided that he was going to persecute all of those who believed <coughs> on the Lord Jesus. He was fanatical about punishing anyone who called on the name of Jesus. As a matter of fact, uh, Stephen, who was a deacon in the church at Jerusalem, was uh, called before the council in that city to give account of himself and his membership in the apostolic church of Jerusalem. He preached to them while he was giving his testimony. He preached to them about the crucifixion of the very Savior they had been waiting for, for hundreds of years to arrive. And when he got to the part in his sermon where he saw Jesus standing in the power of Almighty God, they couldn't take it anymore. So the mob rushed him, grabbed hold of Stephen, dragged him outside the gates of the city, handed their jackets to Saul, who would become Paul later. And then they would stone Stephen to death while Paul looked on. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. <clears throat> there are at least eight scriptural references to Saul's persecution against the church, some by his own testimony. Acts chapter 22, verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death. That is, I persecuted the church, those that believed this, and had them put to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of the elders. He's, he's digging himself a hole of incrimination deeper and deeper and deeper. Usually when people make mistakes, they want to move on. Let's get, let's get past that. Let's, let's not talk about it. Let's, but it's recorded in the pages of the Scripture for our benefit to let us know that it's okay to have the scars as long as you don't let the wound kill you. The high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus, to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished 
Acts 26, 9. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That it is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Can you imagine Paul spewing out such hateful venom and caustic vitriol, demonstrating his hatred for those who followed Jesus by having them put to death, and then coming back later and sending the church at Corinth this message, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Is this the same Paul that was having people put to death a few years ago? Is this the same Paul that was so hateful that he would take fathers away from children and put them in prison and have them killed and leave them orphans? Is this, is this the same guy who's doing that? I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. He said, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity, of course, is love. Charity or love suffereth long. It's kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. It beareth all things. I love that word from the original Greek. It literally means to put a cover over. Thank God. His love puts a cover over all that junk that we've had in our lives. All the things we've done, the person that we were, it covers it. We're covered in his blood. Hallelujah. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. How is it possible for a prophecy to fail when it's superseded by God's greater purpose? There are prophecies that are in place now, but when Jesus comes, those prophecies will never be fulfilled. Why? Because they yielded to God's greater purpose, and that was the rapture. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Love never faileth. Whether it be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. The same guy who wrote this is the one that was killing people just a few years ago. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. <clears throat> There's a whole lesson in this next verse that I don't have time to teach. I've taught it in the past. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we see in two dimensions. If we could see in three dimensions then we could see what God sees. But now we're only seeing things in a glass, so we only see it two-dimensionally. <clears throat> now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I'm known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the time will come when your faith will have been fulfilled and you won't need it anymore. The time will come when your hope will no longer be necessary because what you hope for will have been realized. Now abide in faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is the one that's going to live on eternally, and that is love. And the guy who's talking about it is the same guy who was killing people just a few years before that. Oh, he said, he admitted, he said, I went from synagogue to synagogue to find them. And the ones who were praying to Jesus, who were calling on the name of Jesus, I grabbed them up, dragged them out of there, and threw them in prison, and then got letters to try to put them to death. And now he's saying, 
Now about it, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Doesn't sound like a lot of love involved, did it? There are several schools of thought that are generally used to explain Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians 12. I want to read a few verses there for you. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, the Apostle Paul, of course, is writing. Lest I be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And then he described what that thorn was. He said it was a messenger of Satan. And then he tells us what that messenger was for. He buffeted me. The word buffet from the original Greek means to pound with the fist. Uh, no, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Previously in this same text, he said, uh, around 13 years ago, is that what it was, 13 years ago, he said, I met a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I, I'm not sure. I can't tell. God knows. He said, but it was like one called away into the third heaven. He goes on to say that during that experience, he's speaking of himself in the third person. He said, during that experience, he said, I saw things in heaven that God told me I couldn't tell anybody else. He said, it, it's unlawful for me to utter. It was such a tremendous spiritual experience. I saw things that gave me such insight into the hereafter. And I wish that I could have come back and told you about it, but he, God told me, he said, don't tell, no, 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 don't say anything about this. Just keep this to yourself. <clears throat> and he goes on to basically tell us, I would have loved to have been able to tell you, but if I had, I don't know what the repercussions would have been, so I can't tell you what I saw. But God had, stay with me, but God had to give me a thorn in the flesh to keep me from becoming too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. He must have really seen some. So much that his mind would have been fixed on that. And when he comes back to earth, some say that this happened when he was stoned to death outside the gates of Lystra. They, some conjecture he was stoned to death. He was stoned. <clears throat> in all likelihood, he died. And when that happened... He ascended to the third heaven, and this is where he saw all, all of these things. <clears throat> but whatever he saw might have put him in such a frame of mind that God had to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a thorn in the flesh. I don't want you to get too high and mighty on people. Because, you see, they're still living on terra firma. They're still human. They're still thinking with the carnal mind. And so they might not be able to relate to what you saw. So you just better keep your mouth shut and don't tell them about it. But just so that you won't get too high and mighty, too holier than thou, too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, I'm going to give you a thorn in the flesh to keep you balanced. Wow. He said, three times I asked the Lord to take that demon away from me. Three times I besought the Lord, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, well, I'll look into that tomorrow. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. Well, give it another week, and we'll see what happens. No. The Lord didn't even address that specifically. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. You know what he was telling Paul? You can handle it. You can deal with it. And then Paul would write in another place, I can do all things. What's the rest of it? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. God is not going to prevent you from getting some scars. He is not going to prevent you from getting some injuries. And do you know why? And it's so often I have said, if you haven't been through anything with God, you don't have anything to say about God. So if you go through some things with God, if you have some wounds, if you're hurt every now and then, if something happens to you that results in a scar, then you'll have something to look at and say, hey, I remember that. And you know what? God kept me through it. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. 
Therefore, he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'll look at those scars and say, thank you, Jesus. Could have killed me, but it didn't. That one could have got me, but it didn't. Uh, Hallelujah. I'm still here. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, for when I am weak, then am I strong. What in the world? That doesn't even make sense. You're weak and you're strong. When I'm weak, I'm strong. Oh, no, no, no. You need to understand what he's talking about. He's talking about his flesh. When my flesh can't make it, when my flesh can't do it, when my flesh is wounded, the power of the Spirit that lives in me says, get up and go on. (coughs) Walk on. Keep walking. Just get up and keep. Let me tell you something. From time to time, even as a child of God, you're going to fall down. Sometimes you're going to get knocked down. But you can't stay down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The reason we have scars is because we've been wounded, but we didn't capitulate. We didn't give up. We didn't give in. We didn't quit. We didn't lay down. We got up and kept walking. That's why I got that scar. Did you stop using a knife? No, I still use a knife. I'm just smarter with it now. Hallelujah. Some believe that the Apostle Paul is referring to the idea that his eyesight was never the same after being blinded by the light on the road to Damascus. Remember that? He was on the road to Damascus with the letters in his hand to have uh, people imprisoned and some to bring back to Jerusalem to have them put to death. And his reference to writing in a large hand may have, re- may have reflected the fact that he had poor, poor eyesight. Some believe that the buffeting messenger of Satan used his eyesight problem to keep him humble, and God used it to remind him of the divine revelation he received when he was blinded by the light. So the greater emphasis should not be placed on physical sight, but spiritual insight, which was most important. That's one school of thought that tries to explain this portion of text. Also, his past, some believe, was filled with murder and mayhem against the church which was the reason for a messenger of Satan to buffet him or pound him with his fist by constantly reminding him of the innocent people he had persecuted in his past. Some believe that messenger of Satan used both these things to buffet or pound Paul. That is, a constant reminder of the damage he had done, the perpetual, incessant hammer of guilt pounding against his conscience. Every time he stood up to preach... His guilt would tell him, you hated these people. These people you're preaching to, you murdered their families, their friends. You threw them into prison cells and separated them from their loved ones. Families went bankrupt because you locked up husbands and sons who earned the family's living. You left children fatherless. You preached hate and judgment. You cheered while innocent men were stoned to death. And now you want to preach the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to them? Now you want to tell them about how he loved so much that he died on a cross so that they could live? Do you honestly think they're going to listen to you? Do you really think they want to hear anything you have to say? Do you truly believe that they're not sitting there thinking about all the terrible things you've done to hurt them in the past? The messenger of Satan. You'll never live it down. You'll never live it down. And that messenger of Satan just keeps hammering away, pounding incessantly on Paul's conscience, reminding him over and over and over how worthless he is, how unworthy he is, how many people are sitting there in judgment trying to lock him up in the dungeon of his past, trying to convince him he has no future doing the work of God. Say, well, that's an exception to the rule. No, it's not. That's a common malady. We want to do something good. Want to be good, to love and not hate, to rise above our past to a place where we can leave it behind, a place where it won't haunt us anymore, a place where our conscience is clear, our intentions are pure, our minds are at ease. <clears throat> well, if you'll turn it over to Jesus, he'll give you the spiritual fortitude to harness the past, to remind you that you don't want to go back there. 
But he'll take you by the hand and stride confidently into your future. You can use the past, <clears throat> kind of like the senses of pain when you burn yourself on the stove. You can use the past to remind yourself, I don't want to go back there. Your past will remind you to stay focused on your tomorrows and keep moving forward beyond your yesterdays. <clears throat> there might be scars from your past encounters with sin. You might have deep wounds and hurts that you feel you'll never recover from. Actions that you'll never live down. But Jesus, remarkably, who never seems to forget anything, Jesus has a very poor memory for sins that have been washed away in his blood. Once your past is under his blood, all he sees is where you are and where you're going. Hallelujah. There have been things to occur in our lives, both real and imagined, that have left us with indelible scars. These scars are the clinging remains of memories that can never be deleted from our mind's thought. They are the persistent reminders that sometimes... Life is just tough, and it often leaves its mark. It's during these tough times that we choose to either man up and move on or remain entombed in a graveyard of perpetual despair. It has been said if something doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Scars are the evidence that life didn't kill us. A scar is a mark left on your skin after an injury heals. Dead people don't heal. A scar is proof that you survived. The wound from your trauma might have been deep. It might have taken many years to heal. Your struggle to get past the hurt, the pain, the failure might have taken its toll on your emotions, but you made it. You're here today in God's house, surrounded by God's people, people who love you. The wounds of the dead never heal, only the wounds of the living. Your scars are a testimony that you've healed. You survived the injury, the deep wound, the tears, the agony, the missteps that took you through the addictions that were used to numb the agonies of life. But you survived. And now in God's house, surrounded by God's people, you have a chance to no longer merely survive, but here you can thrive. Somebody say amen. Here you can revel in what the scripture calls righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Here you can become that godly man, that virtuous woman that you know you can be. Here you can celebrate the scars that remind you you're alive. You made it. You're in God's house. You can be free in God's house, free of the past, free of the pain, free of the injury. You'll live with the scars, oh, but every time you look at them, you'll remember the goodness of God, the mercy of God. God brought you through it. God's going to take you on. If he brought you through that, he'll bring you through this. If he brought you to it, he'll take you through it. God is, hallelujah, God is faithful. God is consistent. You can depend on him. And I'll tell you another thing. He has been scarred. Mm. He has been scarred. <clears throat> the scripture tells us he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Do you have any scars, scars from a failed marriage, scars from a friend you trusted who betrayed you, scars from a business that hard work just couldn't save, scars from an addiction that you just weren't able to overcome, scars from a heartbreak that 
wouldn't heal. Scars from wounds so deep that life seemed too painful even to try anymore. But thankfully, Jesus understands scars. He can heal the wounds. He can stop the hurting. He can give you something wonderful to live for. Why? Because he was wounded for us. Jesus has some, oh, hallelujah. Jesus has some scars. The scars of rejection by his own people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Scars from Calvary, open wounds that Thomas saw. And he said, Thomas, put your hand in my side. One of these days, this is going to heal up. One of these days, this won't be a wound anymore. But it will be a constant reminder that I gave my life for the church. And if I ever think about turning her off and shutting her down and saying, I'm tired of your lukewarm attitude, I'll just look down and remember, oh, no, I gave my life for her. I'll do everything I can to win her. And so he stands at the door even now knocking that he might get back into the person, the church, the bride that he loves. He has scars, scars, scars that he took on for you and I. Let's stand together, shall we? Oh, hallelujah. If not for us, there would be no scars on the body of Jesus Christ. I don't know what caused your scars, but whatever they were, whatever the cause, whatever the reasons. Not only can he heal you, <clears throat> but he can give you a wonderful memory. Remember, you survived. A scar is an indication that you've healed. A scar is an indication that at once you were injured. But now, the injury has healed. Dead people can't heal. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, you're alive. You've got the scars to prove it. And if there have been scars that have been so deep in your life, someone who did you wrong, and David felt it so intensely when he was writing the 27th Psalm, that he, it led him for some reason. We don't know exactly why, but it led him for some reason. Maybe he was commiserating with the misery of others. It led him to say, when my father and my mother forsake me. Oh, that is the ultimate forsaking. When my parents don't even love me, the Lord will take me up. I don't know what your scars are today. But they're an indication, indication you're still alive. You came to church. And God wants to heal whatever it is in your life that's sick. If it's your soul that's sick, he wants to heal it today. If it's your body that's sick, he wants to heal it today. If it's your spirit that's sick, he wants to heal it today. If it's your mind that's sick, he wants to heal it today. <clears throat> and the scars that are left over are just reminders of what God did in your life. Let's lift our hands and love him for a moment. Praise the Lord. Puede estar en pie esta mañana, Amen. por favor. Can we all stand together this morning? Aleluya. Puede aplaudir el nombre de Jesús esta mañana. Can we give the Lord a hand, hand clap of praise and magnify Gloria a Dios. the Aleluya. King of kings and Lord of lords? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Puede sonreír al hermano que está a su lado, por favor. Can you smile to the person standing next to you? Amen. Praise Amen. God. Estamos felices de estar aquí esta mañana. Es el lugar natural de la iglesia. This is a natural place for the church. Congregarse. Aleluya. Amen. Salmo 3 verso 3. Reading from Psalm 3 verse 3. Mas tú, Jehová, eres escudo alrededor de mí, mi gloria y el que levanta mi cabeza. So be thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Aleluya. Amen. 
Eres un escudo. He is a shield. Pero no solamente un escudo. But not only a shield. Él es un escudo alrededor de mí. But Gloria he is a shield Señor. that surrounds all Estoy around me. Estoy protegido. I am protected. Estoy guardado. I am guarded. Defendido. I am defended. Porque algunas veces hay dardos que vienen contra mi vida. Because there are times that arrows come toward my Pero life. Pero la Biblia dice. But the Bible says. Ningún arma forjada prosperará contra ti. That no weapon shall prosper against thee. Ninguna. No weapon. Nada nos puede destruir. Nothing can destroy Porque us. Porque él es un escudo. Because God is our shield. Alrededor de mí. All around me. ¿Cuántos creemos eso? How many of you believe that this morning? De un aplauso al rey Let's de reyes. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. El the Señor King of Kings. está aquí. Aleluya. The Lord is here. Nada Amen. me daña. Nothing will harm Soy us. Soy victorioso en el nombre de Jesucristo. I am victorious in the name Vamos a of cantar Jesus. al Señor. So we're going to sing this morning. ¿Cuántos queremos cantar How al Señor? How many want to sing this morning? Levanten las manos los que queremos cantar al Señor. Raise your hand if you want to sing this Hallelujah. morning. Aleluya, aleluya, aleluya. Él está aquí esta he mañana. He is here this morning. Alabe al Señor. Let's worship the Lord. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Amen. Can we magnify the King of Kings? Thank you for standing. You may be seated.
Amen. Have you come to bless his name this morning? I could feel something really cool in the atmosphere. Amen. If you need a change in your life, I believe today is the day. You're in the right place. Amen. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer at this time. If you would like to, you can remain standing with me. We're going to pray for Brother Fortenberry's stepson. He's in ICU in critical condition. Uh, Sister Linda Brown, she needs um, strength and some healing in her body. She's going through chemo. We know that God is, is able. Amen. We need to pray for Brother Gary Wolf and uh, Danny Spears Sr. For Brother Daryl Sims, Linda and Jean uh, Brown, Judy Munn. Uh, for Marcia McNeil for prayer uh, and healing and dealing with chemo. Uh, Desmond Simple, he's having seizures. We're going to pray that God would deliver him. And we need to pray for Sonny, sister Harper's friend, uh, needs healing. Amen. Aren't you glad that we know the healer? Do you believe that, that nothing is impossible for him? I, nothing's off limits for Jesus. There's not a place that he can't go to. I want to, if you would, go with me very quickly to Psalms chapter 107. And verses 26, it says, for they, they mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. It sounds like life, right? Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. Has anybody else ever felt like you're just at your wits end? There's no hope. There's no way out. No answer to your situation. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He makes the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Uh, my wife and I, and this is to bring no attention to ourselves, uh, have been doing a Bible study with Landon and Callista, remember, if you remember, Landon and his um, dad were baptized in Jesus' name. Both got the Holy Ghost a few weeks back, um, and we're rejoicing. But we've been doing some Bible studies with them. And Callista came on Friday, and she, uh, we were talking, and she said, you know, I, I really need to be baptized in Jesus' name. 
She was baptized in Jesus name. What I didn't know that she was taking this material back to her mom. Her mom said it was okay to tell you that she's been kind of in and out of drug rehab. And she was dealing with some things and she got out of rehab yesterday, right? She, uh, she said, well, I want to go and be baptized in Jesus' name. I want the Holy Ghost. Her name is Sherry. Today is Sherry's birthday. And I was telling Sherry, it's one thing when they give you the certificate at the hospital when you were born. But it's a completely different story when you get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life because you were born again. Sherry and her boyfriend, her fiance, Clint, both went down in the water in Jesus' name this morning. It gets better. Sherry said, I came here dealing with withdrawals from drugs. But when she came out of the water, she began to speak in another tongue as the Holy Ghost gave the utterance. Hang on, it's going to get better. She said, when that happened, I felt the withdrawals leave me. I don't know if anybody else came here this morning feeling like you're at wit's end. Like there's no way out of the situation, no answer, no remedy to what you are going through. But I came to tell you there's a very simple solution that still speaks peace to winds and waves of our lives. When torment rages, he is the answer to any opposition you face. Come on, if you've got a need this morning, would you just lift your hands toward heaven? Come on, let's connect together this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every need on this prayer request list. Those dealing, God, uh, this morning with, with, with cancer and, and sickness in their body, financial struggles, those dealing with addictions and tormented by the past, Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would begin to speak, Lord, to the storms of our lives, Lord, begin to calm. You see every hand raised, Lord God, every heart, the position, the condition that we're in. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you are able, God, right now to break every chain of addiction to break every uh, thing of uh, every uh, sickness any shame struggle sin you are here you came to set the captive free you didn't set a limit on what would hold a limit on what would hold us captive but you came to obliterate change you came to break addictions to deliver and we believe it we grab it this morning in the name of Jesus amen would you worship him this morning like he's already done it
Hallelujah. Can we all stand together this morning? Can we give the Lord another hand clap of praise and magnify the King of kings and the Lord of lords? I feel the presence of the Lord in this place today. Our God is greater. Okay, thank you, Sister Wilson. I said our God is greater than any other. All right, we're, we're quiet today. I said our God is greater than any other. Amen. He is an awesome God. Has God done something for you? Say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's an honor to stand before you today to minister the word of the Lord. Amen. I want to give honor to Pastor Shepherd. What a tremendous lesson he taught this morning. If you didn't grasp it, you need to listen to it again at some point. Amen. You can go online and do it. If you weren't here on Wednesday, you need to listen to that lesson, amen, that he taught Wednesday night, this tremendous, amen, teacher of the word of the Lord. And if you heed the teaching of the word, you'll grow, amen, you'll grow in the Lord. I want to give honor to my beautiful wife, amen, my family to support me with prayer, amen, they help me. You know, it's, it's awesome when, without hesitancy, I can just say, hey, could y'all just pray for me? And my family will surround me and pray for me. Amen. And it's, it's, it's great to have a family that supports, amen, me and helps me. Amen. If you will, turn in your Bibles with me or into, on your electronic devices or on the overhead, whatever is convenient for you or you choose to use, to 2 Kings chapter 5. I've been prepared to preach this sermon several times, and for one reason or another, I haven't been able to. So I believe that today's the time. I believe today's the hour. Amen. And I believe we open our hearts and our minds. The Lord has something for each and every one of us here today. Now, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable. Because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, he was also a mighty man in valor. But he was a leper. Verse 10, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call in the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Now Naaman had a a name for himself. Did he not? Naaman defined himself not as a captain, not as a war hero, not as a man of valor, not as an honorable man. He said, the leper. For for a few minutes here this morning, I want to preach on this topic of I thought. Naaman said, behold, I thought this is what the preacher would do. He had a preconceived idea of how everything was supposed to work out. He thought. He said, behold, I thought. I thought you'd just come out, put your hand on me, and I'd be a recovered leper. That's what I thought. And because it didn't work out the way he thought it should work out, he left angry. Don't get angry because God doesn't work it out the way you think. He ought to work it out. For a few minutes this morning, I want to talk on the topic 
of I thought. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you today, and we thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you for the power that there is in your name. I thank you for the presence that's in this house. I thank you for what I feel here today. I pray, Lord, that you would help me deliver your word as you would have me deliver it, dear God. For your honor, for your glory, for your praise. You are mighty God. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts today to receive what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. In Psalm chapter 46, verse 4, it says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Today, I want to wash in that stream. Amen. God is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. I believe that we serve an awesome God. I believe that there is not one thing that is impossible with God. Do you believe that today? Amen. Do you believe that what he does for me he can do for you. Amen. I believe that sometimes we marginalize ourselves. That word came to me this week, marginalize, because I believe that sometimes we do that. Now, to marginalize is to put or keep someone in a powerless or unimportant position within a society or a group. And many times we do that to ourselves. That word came to being from the word margins. Remember when you were in, I don't know, nowadays they may not use notebook paper as much. I think they assign every student a computer nowadays when they go into school. But, you know, we weren't allowed to write in the margins. Right? You had that red line on the left side of the paper. Right, and you started on that line, and that line dictated everything. You indented from that line. You know, you wrote the date against that line. You wrote your name on the right side of that line. Remember the margin? You weren't allowed to go in the margin. You'd get penalized, I think, if you wrote in the margin. We do that to ourselves. We marginalize ourselves sometimes. We put ourselves outside of the margin. We ourselves think that we are not powerful enough. Oh, God would do it for him. God would do it for her. God will heal him. God will heal her. Forgive him. Forgive her. Lift him back up. But as for me, I marginalize myself. I'm in a power where God won't do it for me. Today, I want to break through that margin. You know, it's kind of like the aisle. You know, you're, you're here in the aisle. This is the margin. That's the paper. Everything happens in the paper, but it doesn't happen right here. Well, I want to invite you today into the pew. That's kind of reverse psychology and apostolic because usually apostolics want to invite you out of the pew to the aisle. <laughs> right? But if we're using the aisle as a margin, I want to invite you into the paper I, I want to invite you into the paragraph. I want to invite you into the power of God. He loves you just as much as he loves me. He is for you just as much as he is for me. You are a child of God, and God is for you. Don't allow the devil to make you think that you are not important enough to be forgiven or that you're not important enough to be healed or you're not important enough to be blessed or you're not important enough to receive what God has for his people. We put ourselves in a powerless or an important position in the church. And I believe that is against God's will because God's everywhere even in the margins. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we read, Now Naaman was a captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because of him. by him the Lord had given deliverance into Syria. He was a mighty man of valor. The Bible says, 
but he was a leper. Is that on up there? No. Okay. The but he was. I guess not. In your Bible, is italicized. So, in other words, that was added in there for clarification, right? In most Bibles, I guess not in that one. But usually, he was in my Bible. Yeah, are you looking it up? Is it italicized in your Bible? He, but he was. It's not. How many is italicized? Is italicized? But he was. Is usually italicized. And that is usually put in there for clarification. Okay? Is that he was all this, but he was a, he was a leper. It was added for clarification. However, the original text would say that he was also a mighty man of valor, a leper. There was no buts about it. He was a leper. That was just part of his identity. That was just a part of who he was. It was an exception to the rule. That's who he was. He was a leper. Naaman was a high-ranking officer, a great man, honorable, a mighty man of valor. Naaman was a leper. Leprosy is a skin condition that's incurable. It had many degrees of some lighter kind that did not encapsulate. It did not forbid him from serving in the military service, but there was always a danger that lighter forms of leprosy might develop into severe ones. Okay? His leprosy may not have limited him, but the fact is is that he was a leper. Naaman was not a Hebrew or a Jew, thus he was not restricted from service. He was from Syria, and it is apparent that they did not consider the disease as the Hebrews did. And until they captured or enslaved the young maiden from Israel, leprosy was who he was. Leprosy was who Naaman was. Leprosy was his destiny. It was his stigma. It was part of his identity. He was a mighty man of valor, a leper. You know, you can replace that word leper with anything that is our weakness or something that holds us back. Mighty man of valor, but fearful. A mighty man of valor, bitter. A mighty man of valor, discouraged. Mighty man of valor, addicted. Obviously, I'm not talking about Naaman here. I'm talking about us. We're a mighty man of God, but yet bitter. A mighty woman. Fearful. A great saint of God, discouraged. You know, we come into this place with an identity, successes, accomplishments, testimonials, the list of identifiers. In the list of your identifiers, there is one that challenges your faith. Whether it's a past failure, an illness, a mistake, a besetting sin, depression, fear, or an addiction. You may have come here thinking that that is your destiny. That must remain a part of your destiny. But I want you to know here today that the healer is in the house. The redeemer is in the house. The deliverer is in the house today. You may have come in one way, but you don't have to leave the same way that you came into this place. I want to tell you today that there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you today that our God is greater than any other. That God is great and he's greatly to be praised. He is greater than any crisis. He is greater than any problem. He is greater than any sin. He is greater than any discouragement. I want you to know today that your God is greater than than any circumstance that would come against you. Your God is greater. Stop marginalizing yourself and saying, yeah, he's great, but not for me. I want you to know that God is great for you. So he went into his king. I'll tell you the story. He went to his king. He said, hey, look, king, I heard that in Israel I can get recovered of this leprosy. And in verse, verse 5, the king of Syria 
immediately tells Naaman, go to go. In other words, he was saying, go right away. Don't waste any time. Naaman appealed to his king, and immediately he was dispatched to Israel. We see, Bar says, from the king's readiness, how anxious he was for the restoration of Naaman. His king was ready, anxious for Naaman to be cleansed of the leprosy and restored. Well, let me tell you here today that your king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, is ready to restore you. He is ready to set you free. He has brought you into this place so that you can be cleansed and restored. You need to know today that God is on your side. The devil will tell you that God is against you, but he is a liar and the father of lies. I believe that deliverance is in this place, and I believe that you can be cleansed right now. I believe that you can be healed right now. I believe that you can be restored right now. Somebody's got to believe this. Your king is ready for your restoration. Your king is ready for your healing. Your king is ready for your salvation. Your king is ready to fill you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Naaman's king sent a letter with Naaman requesting a cure for his leprosy. Israel kings, the king of Israel was overwhelmed. He thought, oh, no, they're inciting war because there is no cure. There is no cure for leprosy. Why would that king send me a request? Why would he ask me to recover this leper? It's never been done before. It's like asking me to raise the dead for leprosy was considered, or a leprous person was considered as one that was dead. They were ostracized in Israel. According to the law, they had nothing to do. They were marginalized. Healing was impossible until the preacher or the prophet Elisha sent for Naaman. He said, King, don't worry about him. Send him to me. When Naaman presented himself, Elisha sent out his servant and instructed Naaman through the servant to go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come unto thee, and thou shalt be clean. I will stop right here to mention that leprosy is a type of sin. It could be hereditary. There's some forms that are contagious. And I won't detail it, but just in your mind, think about it. Ever tending to increase or get worse? Leprosy was incurable except by God. It was a shame and a disgrace. It would render one alone in isolated battle. It was deforming and unclean. But the preacher was telling Naaman, you want to get rid of this leprosy? Go and wash Seven times. Seven, as we know, is spiritual perfection, maturation, or completeness. To repeat a formal act six times without perceiving any result. To do something six times and not getting a result. Yet to persevere and repeat it a seventh time requires a degree of faith and trust that men do not often possess. The thing is, is that many quit after one, two, or three times. They quit before they are complete. They quit before they conquer. They quit before they're healed. They quit before God is able to restore them. They quit before they totally get back up. They quit before God is finished. Let me tell you right now. That God is not finished with you yet. Don't quit. No matter how bad you think your situation is. Because God has not quit on you. If you are here today. If you are in this place today. I want you to know that God is still working on your behalf. God is still on your side. And God is working. 
But Naaman got angry. And his response matches many of us here today. But Naaman said, I thought. Naaman's response was, I thought. I thought he would do it my way. I thought he would do it my way. He said, aren't there better rivers in my country? And there were. There were better rivers in his country than any in Israel. They are majestic rivers. They're clean. They're crisp. But you're sending me to the Jordan. Many refer that that river to the muddy Jordan. The Jordan is clay colored, muddy at best. It's inferior to my rivers. Because it did not happen how we thought it would happen. Naaman left angry. He said, I thought. It's an idea, an opinion produced by thinking. To think is to have an opinion or a belief about someone or something. May I remind you today about the carnal mind. In Romans 8, 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know that your mind is the enemy of God. And that was what was working with Naaman, his mind. He thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. I thought he would get up. The preacher didn't even shake my hand. He sent the assistant pastor out there. He didn't pray for me. He just sent, it, sent him out there. Elisha did not preach what Naaman wanted to hear. Elisha preached what Naaman needed to do. Can I repeat that? He, he didn't tell him what he wanted to hear. He told him what he needed to do. And that's where we have issues sometimes. When we don't do what we are asked to do. When we don't obey what is written in the word of God. Isaiah 55 and 8 is something for us to remind us. It says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. Says who? The Lord. Jordan was a 25-mile trek. Thankfully for Naaman, his servants talked some sense into him. If he would have asked some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? And Naaman had gathered an offering to bring the preacher. He said, you were ready to give everything for your healing, but you won't go wash in the Jordan? You're willing to bring a great offering into the house of the Lord, but you're not willing to be baptized in Jesus' name? If he would ask some great thing, but you can't buy your healing, you can't buy your salvation, you can't purchase it, you can't purchase it. He said, just wash and be clean. Thankfully, they convinced Naaman, and Naaman obeyed. He went to the Jordan. I'm running out of time. He went in one time. Got all wet. Nothing happened. Dipped himself again. Nothing happened. He did it again. Came out. Leprosy. He did it a fourth time. Not even a hint of healing. Some of us would have quit. It's not getting better. It's not going away. I'll go one more time. Nothing. You know, the prophet didn't tell him to go three times. 
He didn't tell him to go four times. He didn't say, hey, you're going to get better every day. He just said, go seven times. Seven times, spiritual maturation or completed. In other words, you go till you get it right. In other words, li- li- listen to this. Dip until it goes away. It didn't go away on the fourth time. It didn't go on the way on the fifth time. It didn't go away on the sixth time. Oh, but he went in there the seventh time. He went exactly the same way he did the last six times. You come into this house every day. You're looking for your healing. You're looking for deliverance. You're looking for salvation. You're looking for the Holy Ghost. What didn't happen? You go again. What didn't happen? Go again. What didn't happen? Go, go again until it happens. You pray again. You fast again. You go into your prayer closet again. You read your Bible again. You stand up and praise again. Well, how long? Until it happens because it will happen. He goes in the seventh time. He comes back like a a little child. Then he says, you know what? Now I know. Some of you are here today because of what you thought. Or some of us. Don't leave here today. Don't lose out today because of what you thought. Oh, I thought my ministry was over. I thought my calling was gone. I thought my walk was finished. I thought my healing wasn't coming. If you're still here, that means God isn't finished with you. Go again. Wash again. Go to the altar again. Pray again. Sing again. Read the word again. Read the promise again until you're healing, until you overcome, until you conquer, until you are clean. Go again. Because one time is all it takes for you to come out clean and renewed. When he returned, he said, behold, now I know. He said, now I know there's a God in Israel. Now I know there's a God of Israel. But he wouldn't have known if he would have stopped after the third time. He wouldn't have known if he would have stopped after the sixth time. He wouldn't have known if he would have stopped before. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't marginalize yourself because it hasn't happened. We all stand together. Don't marginalize yourself because you haven't received your healing yet or that blessing yet or you haven't gotten that job yet and begin thinking that God isn't for you. Naaman was a Syrian. You know what that means? He was in the margin. He wasn't even a part of God's people. He wasn't even a, a Jew or Hebrew. As a matter of fact, he had waged war and took, taken a slave. But when he heard, when he heard, I can be healed. He didn't care about the margin. When he heard that there was a possibility. Sister Squire, when he heard, he went to his king. And his king said, go. And he went. And when he obeyed, when he obeyed the word. We feel that God marginalizes us, that somehow we are somehow unimportant enough for God to answer our prayers. Oh, he will answer someone else's. He'll forgive someone else's sin. He will bless someone else. If anyone should have felt marginalized, this name, and he did not belong. These were not his people. This was not his God. But it did not stop Naaman. And it did not limit God. When Naaman obeyed, 
when Naaman obeyed, God cleansed Naaman. I want to ask here today, and I know social distancing is very difficult to have an altar call as we want. And stopped us before. <laughs> How many of you are ready to get out of the margin this morning? How many of you have a need of God today, right now? You need healing that you've prayed for time and time again. There's somebody in this place that needed to hear this message because you're about to give up. And I'm here to tell you, don't give up. Go again. Go again. Go again. God isn't finished. If you are here today, if you are alive and breathing, God isn't finished with you yet. Can we just pray right now? Can we lift our hands right now? If you feel free and would like to come and be prayed for the ministers, we'll... Put a mask on and pray behind you, but we will pray for you. But get out of the margin.